Good morning to you family and friends of Williams students. I'm Christina Walsh, the Dean for First Year Students. We're so glad you're here this weekend and brought such gorgeous weather with you, at least until tomorrow, I think. Um, and thank you for rising relatively early on a Saturday to be here and make the most of today's many sessions and performances that are scheduled. And we do hope you are enjoying yourselves and getting to know the college and your students' lives on a much deeper level while you're here. Before we begin, I wanna remind you that right after this presentation, we'll hear from leaders of co-curricular programs about life outside of the Williams classroom. And at 11.30, President Maude Mandel and Dean of the College, Gretchen Long, will be here to share their thoughts and answer your questions at what we call our Family Day Assembly. So now we have a chance to hear from the people at the heart of the Williams Matter, professors who teach your students. To my immediate left is James Mayon, Woodrow Wilson Professor of Political Science and parent of a 2018 graduate, Evelyn Mayon. James will speak for his colleagues in Division II, which is Social Sciences. To James's left is Tiku Majumdar, Barclay Germain Professor of Natural Philosophy and Chair of Astronomy, who is in the 30th year of teaching in the Physics Department at Williams. Tiku will speak for his colleagues in Division Three Sciences and Mathematics. And to Tiku's left, we welcome Julie Cassidy, Wilcox B. and Harriet M. Adsit Professor of Russian. Julie's research focuses on performance in the broadest sense of the word, in Russian culture, including 19th century Russian theater, Stalinist cinema, and Eurovision Song Contest. I wanna take that class. I wanna take all these classes. Uh, Julie will speak for her colleagues in Division I, Language and the Arts. Each of our panelists will give a brief overview of their third of the Williams curriculum, and then they'll open it up for questions which they are very eager to answer. So get your questions ready. And we'll let Tiku begin. Let's give them all a warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, thanks for being here and getting up uh, uh, on a Saturday morning. I'm glad it's, uh, the weather looks beautiful. Um, just to make the record very clear, also a parent of a Williams uh, student. So I was, my daughter graduated in, in this funny way that has become much more common lately. She was a 22.5 grad, and you all know what that means, right? that there's a lot of, in her class there, I believe, mid-COVID, in the middle of uh, her experience, uh, there were 75 students who graduated in December of that year, so to speak, uh, and so uh, we had a little ceremony in here because that was actually a pretty significant part of the, that class. So, I mean, that gets to an interesting question about how, what, what it was like here in the last few years and what the lasting uh, effects of that all be. I'm sure we can get into that. i just say uh, just a couple of words um, in, in my 30 years, and we were just reminiscing that Julie and I actually arrived at Williams on the same day in the fall of 1994, essentially. Uh, we started teaching in the same year. Um, um, and uh, so, yes, we're in year 30 now, and uh, it's been a really an amazing place for me. I'll, I'll just speak uh, as a scientist. I'm an experimental physicist. I have a lab in one of our beautiful new science buildings that we were able to design and construct and uh, go through a long 10-year process, and now we have two, two lovely new science buildings that will serve the next generation of Williams faculty and students, uh, multiple generations, I think, wonderfully well. Uh, so I have a lab in one of those buildings uh, where we study the structure of uh, certain atoms, in particular lead atoms at the moment, uh, using lasers uh, as spectroscopic tools. So I have students who build, design, uh, make, analyze data, uh, um, uh, go to conferences with me, publish papers with me, uh, and, and I couldn't do the work I do here at Williams without uh, without them, it's, it's a collaborative project, the kind of work we do, and so many of my colleagues in, who have lab, lab science uh, programs um, and <clears throat> having wonderful undergraduates is a reason that I came to Williams and a reason that I'm very happy that I made a, a great choice to balance research and teaching in, in this particular way. No graduate students, so the undergraduates get really uh, active and, and um, uh, you know, central research uh, experiences, I think. Um, I've, I've, I've had 40 or more senior thesis students in my career, probably a little bit more than that now, um, which is a particularly nice thing for us because we get to have an extended 
time together with undergraduates working. And I really wanted to, this is a little bit about Williams in the classroom, and I just wanted to make the point that much of what we do uh, over there on, the, on our part of campus uh, in the sciences involves uh, making the laboratory a classroom. Uh, it, it is very much some combination of research training but also teaching without question. Uh, whether or not they go on to be professional scientists or not, I think the, the kind of research experiences that we offer, which take one form in our world and a different form in the, in the worlds of, uh, in, in the academic worlds of my colleagues, but um, it's just quintessentially liberal arts work. You have open-ended questions. Nobody really knows the answer. You're trying to figure it out together. Uh, you do a lot of research to try to figure out what has been done and how you might do it, and then, and then you discover some new things and, and uh, make some uh, dead ends along the way. It's just a really fun process to, 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 to be involved with students in that way. Uh, so that part of the classroom experience, I guess, for me, has been probably the most rewarding part of my, my time at Williams, I, I, I would say. Um, and of those many thesis students, amazingly, two of them are now back as faculty colleagues of mine. So it really makes me feel a little old to, to know that now two of my own former students are Williams, Williams professors, um, one in the physics department and one in the chemistry department now. So it's, uh, that's pretty cool. I'll stop there. Happy to talk more about um, uh, anything you're interested in talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm happy to go next. Once again, my name's Julie Cassidy, and I teach in both the Department of German and Russian and in comparative literature. And I wanna start off by thanking all of you who are here for creating and supporting and helping the students that we get, because by more than anything else I've ever done as an academic, my favorite activity is teaching your kids. Williams brings the most curious, the most engaged, the most energetic students I've ever seen, and it makes my job a joy, and it really has informed what it is my students want, how it is they like to learn, how it is they don't like to learn. This has informed who I am as a teacher and what it is that I do in teaching in Div Division I, the arts and the humanities. As Tiku mentioned, um, essentially, I'm doing the same thing he's doing. I'm working with data, and we're answering questions that we don't have any clear answer to, students and teachers together. It's just different data and a different method. Our data is basically human creativity. Um, uh, I work on a number of things you can tell. If the Eurovision Song Contest is in my research, I'm not just working on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, <laughs> which I do teach, okay? But any creative product, pop culture, dance, the visual arts, video, film, this is what we work on, and that's our data. And we come to that data with questions that I would argue are some of the most important that humanity's ever confronted. And um, I'm a huge lover of teaching in tutorials because it, that format, which Williams is well known for, really fosters the kind of learning that Williams students thrive in. The kind of genuine Socratic learning where I bring a question that I really don't know the answer to and all of us work on it together. So, you know, I'll use a tutorial I'm teaching. It's not about the Eurovision Song Contest, but I'll use that as an example of what I'm talking about. So the tutorial I'm currently teaching is devoted to Fyodor Dostoevsky's masterwork, The Brothers Karamazov. And this is a novel that, as I said, tackles some of the biggest questions humanity's faced. Why are we on this planet? Is there a God? What is the meaning of that God? What does it mean to believe in a God if there is unmitigated human suffering all around us? And if you've been listening to the news, you can realize this is a pressing question, not only for us, but also for the students I'm teaching. And so this tutorial allows us, by working with the data of the Brothers Karamazov, to actually get at those questions. And um, tutorials are really uh, wonderful because I do all my heavy lifting before the course ever begins. I design it, I put out assigned readings of the novel, of supporting texts, and then the students basically get in the driver's seat of the car and they drive us where we need to go. The ideal tutorial is when the pair of students who are working together come, one of them will present a paper that they've written, the other will respond to that paper, and I will sit there taking notes for more than half of the class time that we have together. 
I just sit there, I listen to where they're going, and then when it's the right time, I'll say, but what about, and I'll fill in the gap with a thing that seems important to me or interests me, or perhaps will guide them of their own volition towards the answers they're looking for. In this course right now, and has anyone ever read The Brothers Karamazov? Oh my gosh, congratulations to you. The rest of you, get on it, come on. It's one of the greatest novels ever written. Um, I'm lucky, I get to read this book uh, once every other year or so, I know it pretty well. Um, but we're about halfway through, and so the big crime, those of you who've read it will know what I'm talking about, has just happened. And I can tell you that not only are my students having their world rocked, I have students who tell me afterwards, I spent all week thinking about whether I believe in God or not. Okay, or I spent all week wondering, what does it mean that my spiritual life is so nothing at Williams? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was not on the assignment, trust me. I did not tell them to go there. Um, at the same time, I'm learning from them. They bring new views, new ways of uh, understanding this text to me that I've never considered before. I have students who write papers about their brothers Karamazov I've never imagined and I've never read before, and it's incredibly enriching. And to my mind, this is, you know, not only these big pressing questions, but this method that we really love privileging at Williams, the tutorial, it really does an amazing job of giving our students, your kids, uh, tools that they can transfer pretty much anywhere in their lives when they move on. So I'll stop there. Hi everybody, I'm Jim Mann. I teach in political science and political economy. And uh, thanks for coming out. And you guys, uh, it's a beautiful day outside and you know, I could be grading papers right now and this is a lot more fun. <laughs> but you have, you have the alternative of going outside and, and enjoying a beautiful morning in Williamstown, which I don't think we're gonna get many more like this for a while. Um, so, like Julie, I'm, I teach tutorials. Um, I'm doing, actually, both of the tutorials that I traditionally offer, I'm doing both of them this year. One of them is called The United States in Comparative Perspective, and that's what I'm doing now. And then in the spring, I'll do one on Cuba and the United States. My specialty in political science is Latin America, and my research is mostly about fiscal policy and, you know, how to design tax systems and so on, and also how to sell them politically. And um, uh, I, I have uh, had lots and lots of students uh, write theses, and that's, that's really enjoyable. In the political economy program, I teach the core courses, and mainly one of them, the first one, and I have taught with, they're taught with uh, economists, so we have two people in the classroom, and I've taught with about 16 different economists over my career. I came here in January of 1990. Um, something about tutorials, I think, to just expand on what Julie says, it, it, you know, sometimes uh, you, you get a little disappointed in them if they haven't done all the reading and they present a paper on one particular part of it and criticize the author for saying something, or for not saying something that is actually in the part that they didn't read. Um, but most of the time, it's, it's, they're quite creative about it and you can track students over the semester and see a kind of growth and also a kind of continuity because most of them have kind of themes that they keep coming back to. Um, I also have done through winter study, and you guys know something about winter study, um, travel courses which I think are the very best use of winter study. And I've taken uh, a couple courses to Cuba and uh, one to Panama and uh, I've also done some alumni trips to, to Cuba, several. So, those are actually part of the Williams curriculum too, I think. And um, in a way, travel courses during winter study can be something that changes a student's entire trajectory. And that's pretty inspiring to see because you can, you're, you're right there when it happens, right? And um, by the end, they're, they're raising questions that they hadn't even conceived of before. Uh, so that's, that's pretty wonderful. So I imagine you all have questions for us, and I can imagine the kinds of things that you might have questions about, so we should probably open it up to you. Go ahead. I'm familiar with the tutorial system, but not everyone may not be, so do you want to describe maybe a little bit further on what the tutorial is and how it's structured? Repeat the question. Yeah, so the, the question was about tutorials. Um, 
since the, uh, since these guys have already mentioned tutorials, uh, maybe I'll just say every department uh, offers tutorials in some format. The traditional, I guess you could say, the origin story is the Oxford mo model, which is the two two students arriving, one having r uh, written a paper and the other critiquing it, and a, and a, and a faculty member to kind of oversee, j just in the way that was that's been described. Uh, I, I think in in William's way, they uh, we've we've kind of adapted that. Uh, so uh, the physics department teaches tutorials, but they don't take the, the format that we just heard. But the key, the essence is they're small classes. Uh, the, the faculty member always meets with students in pairs. Um, one of the nice things for us is that we, that in the sciences, um, particularly in, in physics, we teach tutorials where a pair of students work together and everybody's get, gotten assigned some very challenging problems, uh, that is like homework problems that, that are, require independent research, uh, reading textbooks, thinking, working together, and then coming with sort of partially completed problems and getting up to the board and actually running through their solution up to point, parts A, B, and C, and then here's where we got stuck and now I could insert myself and say, okay, w what exactly were you thinking would be the next step? And, and what was your argument like about what, where, why did you get stuck and, and what, what to do next? It's this just-in-time kind of teaching, which is wonderful, and we can have pairs of students who are focused on problem three uh, and other students who are focused on problem four, uh, but got problem three, no problem, and you can individualize the teaching in a beautiful way. So for us, we teach advanced courses um, where they've already had some foundational coursework in the traditional, more traditional um, format, <clears throat> and then we teach several courses in this format. So, so I just thought it would be worth saying that every department at Williams has kind of yeah. created what works, and obviously within departments, people are choosing subjects that they themselves are experts and passionate about, but uh, the, the, the diversity and wealth of, of tutorial offerings is really quite, quite amazing if you look at them all. Yeah. Yeah, and um, perhaps it's also worth mentioning the uh, skills that students are developing in these tutorials. I think Tiku described very nicely, you know, this focus then in his department. The tutorials I teach, because they are focused by and large on um, literary cultural texts. I also teach another tutorial on political cults of personality in the 20th century. So that is a combination of more social scientific texts and also more, you know, humanistic texts. But in both of those tutorials, the real emphasis is on writing. It's, an, you know, students produce in a tutorial six papers in the course of a semester. And in my tutorials, they rewrite two of those papers. And this gives me an opportunity as a teacher to focus very, very closely on what an individual student is good at as a writer and what they might not be good at. And it can be very, very um, dramatic, the improvement, the changes that students make when you have that ongoing dialogue over the course of 12 weeks about writing. Um, the other skill, and different people do the critique differently, but I insist my students speak extemporaneously. They have notes, but they need to talk off the cuff, um, is how do you formulate an argument when you are speaking extemporaneously, which is a skill chances are all of us have to use on a daily basis, and one that they might not necessarily run into in that focused way. So, and once again, it's the opportunity, they will do this six times in the course of a semest semester, excuse me, and I'll give them very detailed feedback about you were not organized, you spoke too quickly, why didn't you look your partner in the eyes when you were telling them that their pe paper was not so good? Or if you critique something, why don't you tell them how they can improve it? That's the only fair thing, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, there's some very specific skills and students can really advance on a very, very you know, rapid learning curve in a tutorial. Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you a little bit about what we do with writing. I mean, it's a, uh, for, for example, I'll ask them, for the first couple of weeks, I'll ask them to read their papers so they get to hear themselves write in a way. And then I'll ask them to summarize, so basically off the cuff, so they have to do what Julie was just describing. They have to, they have to not look at your paper, but basically walk through it and, and give, us, give us the high points in, in your own words. And then at some point, usually toward the end, I... Uh, ask them to read each other's papers. There are certain students who are, I think, who are at a high enough level of writing so that hearing their words being spoken by someone else 
lets them pay attention to the rhythm, the sound, um, really the music of, of, of prose. And so those are ways to improve. And then finally, I ask them all in, in a final exercise to turn in a one-page paper in E prime, which is English without the verb to be. It gets them out of the passive voice and uh, they have to start reaching in for, for some of those wonderful Anglo-Saxon strong single uh, syllable verbs uh, that we all use in ordinary speech, but many, real, many students don't use in written work. So I have a how did this good thing happen question, and, and um, my daughter's a first year, so she's only a couple of weeks in, but what both my wife and I hear is there's a ton of feedback in the learning how to learn process. There's more than I remember in college of um, in the process of trying to master a new subject or uh, about writing and how to write clearly or how to approach certain kinds of tests they may not have seen before. There seems to be a consistent approach across curriculum, or not consistent, a consistent approach to allow people the opportunity to make mistakes correct and learn, and then go forward. The question is, how did that happen? I would say this is at the core of the liberal arts. Um, and it, you're right, this is, this is a great question. How did it happen that we're all, despite the fact we don't talk about this explicitly, providing detailed feedback? Um, I can speak personally, I am much more interested in my students' process of learning than I am at, at, in some final outcome like a grade. Giving the letter grade at the end of the semester, least interesting part of what I do. But I am fascinated by how they're acquiring knowledge. And to get very concrete, I also teach Russian language at all levels. I love grading homework, okay? I'm also, one of the ways I can do it, I'm lucky. I have small classes, and Williams in general, compared to many schools, as you're well aware, has very small classes. But if I, right now, I'm teaching advanced Russian to five students. I can tell each and every one of them, you need to review this. You haven't memorized that. You're doing great with the other. And that actually, I derive pleasure from it. So I'm guessing my colleagues are the same way. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I, I would, just a couple other comments on this. Um, it's an interesting question. <clears throat> First of all, I think it's important to note that there's structural uh, there is some structural control, even in the, in the very diverse way in which we teach. Uh, nobody is telling any of us what we're doing in the classroom, and so, so organically, your question, sort of, how, how is this happening? So there is some overall sense of, of, of uh, good ideas get spread around. There is support, talking about how students learn to learn. Um, it's not just from us, it's from peers. I think it's really important to note that it's, it's from peers, it's from support services throughout the college, which have, in my 30 years, have become dramatically better on the, on, in terms of like the, the, the support for, for students who are struggling in particular ways to get what they need early on so that they can get back on track. So there is, there, 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 it's, it really has to be said that the, that the administration, the deans, the, the other sorts of, um, um, uh, resource, resources have, have I think, uh, grown up. The peer learning, I think, is really important because that's not just having TAs uh, helping to run TA sessions, which we do in my department, for example. Uh, it's having uh, a senior working with a sophomore or a freshman uh, in the lab, showing them what that's about and how to do it, with me not even in the room. Uh, it's, it's, it's having, uh, you know, it's, it's this sort of working together on problems uh, it, it, and learning that, you know, oh, you think this way and I think this way about that, maybe we can help each other and, and teach each other uh, how to do it. But I, I do think that, um, in particular, the last thing I'll say is that, is in particular, in the STEM field, we have a lot of students who arrive at Williams that exceedingly good at what got them into Williams in the STEM field. They've, they know a ton of stuff. They've memorized a ton of stuff. Um, they know, uh, <clears throat> they have a lot of information content in their heads, uh, and they're, they have really good memories. Um, there's a point at which um, I almost feel like there's a moment where we, in, in particular in a field like mine, where we have to unlearn some of that, and, and it, maybe the first test is, is, is an example of when they might realize that, oh, wait a minute, this is a problem you're assigning us on the exam that we never saw anything like uh, in the, which, which problems that, you know, which lecture did you explain that problem in? And, and, and this happens, uh, interestingly, particularly uh, for people who come from systems 
international, uh, international students who come from systems that are educational systems that are quite different, where it might be the case that there's, they, they, they don't immediately confront problems that, that are new problems in, in a situation like that. So there is a, a sense in which we're trying to kind of like break down the sense that, that physics, for lack of, for just as an example, is a, is a set of facts that we, that we learn and, and try to, to then build up this notion that we're trying to draw information from different places and creatively come up with an answer to a problem you've never seen before. Because that, uh, speaking of the essence of liberal arts, that's what we want. Is, uh, because, because undoubtedly, whatever job they have next or wherever they go after Williams, they will immediately be confronted with a problem they've never seen before and they'll have to draw from various things from maybe many courses. They'll have to write, they'll have to present, they'll have to reason, uh, drawing things from, from various ways. So, so that's, I, I think, the goal that we all share. It takes some different forms, but um, it doesn't, it, it's not a complete accident, I guess, that, that, it, that, it, that it happens. So, question, I think there was a question there. Uh, I just had a quick question on tutorials. Um, do you guys, is there a certain time, should they wait until they're older to take those, and should they plan to spend significantly more time for tutorials than for an average class? Um, I, I can take that. Uh, okay. I mean, we teach them at different levels. So I have one that's, you know, the, the course number generally gives them a clue. So I have one that's really pitched towards sophomores right now. And I'll have one pitched towards juniors and seniors in the spring. And uh, so the, the, the time commitment is, I think, students think it's more. Um, so I, I imagine that, you know, and we do notice that there are certain kinds of students who try to stay away from tutorials, but if they're, if they're a writing intensive course and they have to take a writing intensive course, then they will enroll in them. Um, so that's, that's most of it. And for us, it's a bigger time commitment in part because there's more class time. So I have to make, for tutorial pairs, we have usually limited to 10 students, so I have to make five blocks of 90 minutes uh, every week for the tutorial. And then there'll be times when students can't make it, or we have Mountain Day or something, and I have a, a couple on Friday. Well, I'm, you know, this week I did a couple of tutorials. One of them was between 9 and 10.30 p.m., and uh, I'll do another one of those next week because my department's doing hiring and I can't, I can't meet when we have a regular so that's, that happens. But, um, so yeah, it, it's a time commitment on our part to be with them, but it's also, I think, they think it's a, they're gonna be, they're gonna be on for 75 minutes, so. Yeah, and um, you know, to add to that, uh, you know, I too, the tutorial on cults of, political cults of personality, that was designed for first year students. And I imagine, given that many first year students are taking 100 level courses in which there might be a larger number of people, they might be able to fade into the background, the sensation is more work because as Jim said, there's no fading into the background in a tutorial. Having said that, I think the most significant consideration is the nature of the time they spend. Um, a tutorial requires that students figure out time management in a way that another course might not require. If you are you know, presenting a paper on a Monday, you have to turn it in on a Sunday. How many days do you need to write a good paper? And then you have to back up, how long will it take me to read this chunk of material I've been assigned and synthesize it? So that's something that isn't necessarily built into standard courses, but is absolutely required for a tutorial. Good time management. So you've all been at Williams for decades. If you were, I don't make that much sound. <laughs> if you reflect back to when you arrived, whether it's the students, the faculty, the curriculum, the teaching methods, what's similar and what's changed? I'll just take a quick, I'll start. <clears throat> That the, the essential features haven't changed for me in 30 years. That, that is, the, the, some of the things we've been talking about already, um, about the, 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 the close connections with students, the developing skills, being able to individualize our education uh, to students uh, in, in a certain way and watch their growth and, and, uh, over, over time. And uh, so uh, for me, that's, that's been a constant. Uh, I think that... Um, some of the things that have changed are more external. I think uh, I, I, 
you know, I'm sure that students would think of me as someone from a past generation. It's funny, I started at Williams. Uh, my kids were born in the first, my first twins were born in the fall of my first semester. So the Williams students seemed very grown up to me. And then slowly <laughs> my kids grew up and then they became the same age. Uh, um, and my twins are now next week turning 29. So, uh, so now, they, now the kids are seeming younger to me than, 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 than I remember. But, uh, so, but there is this sense in which um, I think <clears throat> in 30 years, one thing that's happened without question is that the diversity of the Williams student body has dramatically changed. Um, and um, I think that's, that's a wonderful thing, to, uh, but it presented, has presented, I think, us, and if you add diversity of backgrounds um, and, and, uh, and COVID, for example, in, in recent years, there has been a big challenge, particularly felt maybe in, in STEM fields where preparation gaps have become um, a thing that we have to really confront. That is to say, we have students equally smart, equally excited, equally passionate about studying subjects who maybe just had like terrible high school experiences for one reason or another or many. Um, uh, in particular preparation areas that we maybe 30 years ago would have assumed every Williams student would come and would have had this already. <clears throat> so I think it's made it, it made it challenging for, uh, I'll just speak personally, for, for me as a teacher to learn how to become more, uh, to, to, to learn how to be even more kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, accommodating of students with lots of backgrounds who after a year at Williams maybe uh, are gonna be in wonderful shape to just take advantage of everything, but arrived at Williams with a sense of like, okay, we, there, there are some extra resources we need to, we need to, uh, we need, we need to invest, whether it's writing or, 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 or math skills or, or, or whatever. <clears throat> so so that, that's been one of, the, one of the things that I think uh, has been actually a great lesson to learn and, and even if COVID is really a thing of the past, uh, in terms of the extremeness of what we had to deal with, and what students in middle school and high school had to deal with, um, it's going to be a long-lasting uh, lesson for us. So that's one, that's one thought. Um, I would also add, in addition to the student body becoming more diverse, the faculty and staff at the college has become more diverse by whatever criteria you'd want to use, whether it's race, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, and that seems to be a pretty significant change for a place like Williams, which, you know, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, really was a bastion of white wasp men. <laughs> so, you know. That, that seems pretty significant to me. Um, also, what we teach is much more diverse. I had the opportunity to look at some old course catalogs from mid 20th century, and they're very slim. I mean, Williams taught a narrow range of acceptable topics, did it well, and we are teaching so many more things in response to the fact that the world demands that. Um, the last thing I'd add, and this has to do, I think, very much with the era we live in, the fact that today's students have had to go through the pandemic. Um, in the time I've been at Williams, I've seen students are more anxious and they're more aware, self-aware of their anxiety. And that's something that has, uh, on a certain level, it makes me sad to be, see people so young who are so aware of the things in the world that threaten their security. On the other hand, I'm very impressed by their self-awareness and it's created uh, changes in my teaching and my communication with them that I truly appreciate. Yeah, I would say one of the things that I've done in response to that is that I, I normally try to bring every student into office hours because we r routinely find that the people who come to office hours are the ones who don't need to come to office hours. Um, and so, uh, so I sort of require people to do that and, and get to know where they're at and, and what their background is and, and how the course is sitting with them, what they might feel challenged by and so on. Uh, and I can say also a little bit about COVID, because COVID changed, I think, a lot of people's teaching uh, in a way that's permanent. In my case, it forced me to do something I was thinking of for a long time, which was the flipped classroom, which is where you, uh, you will do a, a video over a PowerPoint presentation and record it as a lecture that the students can look at any time they want to, and usually, you know, 20, 20 to 30 minutes. And, uh, and the idea there is they can look at part of it, they can look at all of it, but it's, it's doing something that you would do in the classroom, but now you have more room in the classroom to do discussion. So 
Uh, and, and for me, that was a real gift. I, I basically have gone to it with all of my courses, um, just because this is the sort of thing that with 75 minutes twice a week in a 12-week semester, I always felt a little crunched. And now I can put the material online. They can get it when they want to in, in parts. They can look at it several times. They can look at it before the exam. And, uh, and that was a benefit of COVID. And of course, it, during COVID, that was done in part because we were on the fly arranging additional sections for, for some people. You know, somebody got sick, somebody else uh, you know, couldn't make it at a certain time, or somebody else is quarantining, they're in the room, we have to figure something out. And so putting it up online made it really easy to be flexible. Uh, just one thing to add to that. It's, it's worth knowing to, for you that we, Williams is like many institutions in a big demographic shift. Um, we have a lot of retiring faculty. Uh, I guess I would put us in the category of that demographic bu bubble. Um, we're not gonna be here forever. I think it, one of the exciting things is uh, uh, that the, the very opportunity to hire tremendous numbers of new scholars uh, and, and teachers to Williams as Julie said, has diversified the, the, the faculty tremendously, in, both in terms of, of their embodied diversity, but also what they teach, what they, and how they, they think about teaching. And I would say that they are coming from a world of much more intentional uh, focus on pedagogy and what kind of pedagogy works. And so some of the old folks have been forced to kind of like maybe slowly move in a direction that perhaps we should have been moving more, even more, in terms of things like the flipped classroom. But every new faculty member at Williams is arriving knowing everything about what is best practices uh, in, and some really, and just are, are incorporating this in, in, in natural ways. And I think bringing us along, I've been really inspired by my young colleagues um, in, in how, how committed they are to some, some uh, novel ways of, of, of teaching, which is, I think, really, really healthy for the institution. Um, this is incredibly inspiring, and thank you especially for doing this on a weekend. Can you tell us a little bit in terms of like career progression and like do students evaluate you and what does that feel like and how is that used in sort of your careers? Just give us some insight into that. Oh gosh, yes. We can talk about this in great detail because Williams does a lot to uh, get students input about how we as faculty members are functioning. The first and most obvious way is like pretty much every other school, there are fill in the blank forms, you know, bubble forms. Well, they're not actual forms now. We finally went online after many, many years um, in which students evaluate every single course they take. And these include standardized questions and open-ended responses. And uh, after all the grades are done and the course is done, we have access to this. And this information is taken very seriously as people are evaluated for their teaching at Williams, both before tenure and afterwards. Um, in addition, all departments interview students for junior faculty members. So when people first arrive at Williams, which if you've never been to a liberal arts college can be a big cultural adjustment, then we have the opportunity to find out, you know, get the details behind the numbers. What do students really think? And that information is aggregated. It is, of course, kept anonymous, but it is also given to those junior professors so they can really get a good sense of what's going on. So those are two means whereby, you know, we do get very substantive input from students about how we're teaching and how do we incorporate it? Well, I think we take it very seriously. If students say this wasn't good, we're, we try and figure out how to change it. And my guess is each one of us has things that we're more sensitive to and that we're more concerned about and that we respond to. So. Um, just I, so I happen to serve currently as a faculty elected faculty member on the committee that does all the appointment and promotion work at the college called the CAP, <clears throat> which is a very interesting committee. About one of the things we do is is look at how junior faculty are evaluated. It's very holistic. So there are there are these forms. There are these interviews. Uh, senior faculty are involved in uh, in, in and, and it, it's a very <clears throat> It's a very thorough system. There's an annual process where we self-evaluate ourselves. We write about how, as a junior faculty member, how the year went, 
in my own words, what, what, do, I want to, what do I want to improve, what, what do I think went well? And this is not just about teaching, it's also about scholarship. And the scholarship, of course, at the Williams takes very different forms, uh, even just a, in the, in the, on this stage. <clears throat> Um, but, but each department knows what that scholarship should look like and can comment on that. So we also uh, think about that. The idea is that every year there's an annual process of evaluation so that, there, so that there's no, like, six years go by and you have no idea how you're doing. I mean, that, that does not happen uh, in a very, it, it, and things have gotten much better at Williams in terms of giving feedback about that because, um, as Julie mentioned, um, the first year is not necessarily one that any of us would want to think back <laughs> as like our best year <laughs> of all. So it's a process of, of, of learning how to be a good teacher. I, I mean, some people have had a lot of teaching experience when they arrive. Um, most of the science faculty that are here came out of a postdoc, uh, kind of doing all research, maybe a little bit of graduate student TAing. Many of us uh, would have entered the classroom in year one, the first, really doing the first substantive classroom teaching um, uh, at that point. So, um, so yeah, <clears throat> it's a good question and, and something that obviously, you know, it, it, you know we, we still work on as senior faculty members. We have the privilege, of course, of not being, you know, evaluated in a sense where, where our jobs are on the line. So it's a stressful time and being on the committee that I'm on, I'm very aware of the, of, the, of that stress, I think, right now. Okay, also, there's this thing called fact track. I, try and I have no idea what it, what it does, but because but, uh, we have no access to it. But uh, ask your students about it. Ask, ask your kids about it, because, you know, it's out there. So they have a real-time conversation about us. It's, it's, it's kind of like yik-yak for, uh, for, for faculty, for evaluating faculty, so. Yeah. And, and I want not to know what's on that, so <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks again for your presentation. Would you describe some of the ways that you collaborate as faculty members across divisions, across disciplines? Yeah, I can tell you that I collaborate routinely with, with economics faculty um, in the political economy program, and that's been built into the program since 1946 when it was created. Um, but we do have some other collaborations at the college that reach across uh, divisions, and so there are some. I imagine you can expand on it. Well, um, uh, there are a variety of different roundtables and um, umbrellas under which faculty can, ga can gather, either if they want to uh, share their research interests, and those can range from reading groups that are sponsored by a Center for Humanities and Social Sciences on the Williams campus, to um, sort of informal associations of people who get together and write once a week in the same room to offer support, and also teaching roundtables where groups of people can gather to collaborate on pedagogy and just try and figure out, you know, how do you run your classroom? What are the challenges that you have because you have a big lecture or because you have a small seminar? So there's a lot of opportunities for that. And I'd also like to emphasize that a lot of us collaborate far beyond Williams. Uh, my most substantial research collaboration is with a colleague at the University of Oklahoma. And um, the great thing about Williams is that we get ample support as academics and as intellectuals for any of this and all of this, which is really, really nice. <laughs> Uh, Williams is also we structurally have put into place a lot of new programs that have focused on sort of new areas of study. I mean, many of the most exciting scholars that are arriving at Williams are doing work that sits really at the boundary between disciplines, right? I mean, it's certainly true in the sciences. I think it's true everywhere. I mean, people are trained in areas where they're intentionally interdisciplinary. So how do they fit into uh, a, a sort of a department structured uh, kind of uh, historical uh, uh, situation. Well, it's an interesting question. And one way that we've adapted to that is, of course, they might have a home in a department, but um, we, we have, a, a, we have a, a program in comparative literature, which, which looks at literature across departments, and we have affiliates all throughout different length, uh, I mean, in, in your department, in, and yeah. in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Asian languages and, and in English. And, and so we can build these nexuses that bring together people across and have majors or have 
concentrations. As you may have gathered, there's, there's something called a concentration that's a, uh, not quite a minor, but a, but, a, but, but a group of courses, six or seven courses that, that actually cross disciplines. Um, and I think as things have come up and become more prominent, we've made an effort to try to find a critical number of faculty. My daughter uh, uh, was a psych major, so that was her main major, but she, she <clears throat> was a concentrator in public health. And public health is one of those highly I mean, if think about something that's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 at the moment, something that uh, is drawing a lot of student interest and, and should. Uh, so she's now working in the area of public health, but it wasn't a major at Williams, but she had courses from economists, from psychologists, um, from biologists, um, it, all, across the college, all focused on the topic of, uh, of, of public health. And so, so that, that's just one example of the way that we've tried to kind of build interdisciplinarity into the system, in addition to individual faculty being themselves <laughs> interdisciplinary. I've heard over and over again from Williams alum how amazing the faculty are and how life-changing relationships have been with individual faculty members. And I can see from what you're describing in tutorials and small classes that a lot of that can happen in the classroom. I'm interested in learning about the connections that you form with students outside of the classroom. I've heard about like sharing a meal. Does that only happen if you know the professor? Can people reach out to professors that they don't know whose area of interest that they're interested in? And how does that work? Oh gosh, those there are a lot of opportunities for that. And two that immediately come to mind, there's uh, something called Lyceum. And these are kind of dressed up dinners that happen in the faculty house where students invite professors and I've been invited to these, and to be honest, it's always been students in my courses, but I don't think that's a limitation. Students can invite any professor they want. They're a bit crowded and competitive, so you won't always get in, but there's Lyceum, and then in response to that, because Lyceum was so popular, slightly less formal, less dressy is Dodceum. So in other words, the same idea in the dormitory called Dodd House. Um, in addition, there are funds offered by a variety of programs, a variety of uh, entities on campus for simply entertaining students, whether that would be in a classroom or going out for a meal. We also have the opportunity simply to go eat in the dining halls with students. This is something I do with students who speak Russian once a week. We have a Russian table, Ruski Stol, and we all go and we speak Russian and we eat together. And I know that the history department does this all across campus, different entities. So there are myriad opportunities. There's lots going on. And um, many professors, I think probably all of us included, we try and do things that are outside the classroom with our students to inspire them to ask us to do more. Yeah, I, I think there there are a variety of ways in this that this happens, and it, it is true that everyone's busy. Students are busy, faculty are busy. Uh, so sometimes uh, you tend to the students tend to cluster in the departments or the professors that they know well. Uh, how much students are able to expand uh, probably depends on whether they have um, they happen to have an interesting overlap with them for other reasons like. There are faculty members who participate in, in things on campus, uh, either stu w with activities, with student groups, with uh, musical activities. Um, I play in, uh, I, I, I'm a French horn player and I play in the college orchestra in addition to uh, a number of other groups that I've played in over time. And so I've gotten to know some students way outside of physics uh, <laughs> from, from being just sitting on the, on the stage and playing music with them. Uh, so uh, there, are, there are a variety of ways to do that. I think faculty are open to this, uh, to, to, to that, and I think it's, it's really fun to get to know students out, outside of one's discipline. Fi final thing is that we all, te I, 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 we teach classes not just to majors in our own, uh, it, it, maybe by the time they get to upper level tutorials or they're working in my lab, they're physics majors or they're, they're, they're in, in our department. But I teach a course in, not surprisingly, uh, a, a non-majors course that actually does the physics of music because I'm interested in both. And um, so that, that course is entirely not physics students. So I think that's another way that when we teach broad introductory courses that are to first years who aren't going to be majors in our, uh, uh, in our sub, we, we de definitely, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to reach across 
uh, and, and meet students from, from very different subjects. Oh, I forgot my favorite way to eat with students. Um, the Russian program has an annual potluck dinner in which we take uh, students to the grocery store. We get them recipes and ingredients. They cook the food, and we all get together and eat. And that, we just had that about a week ago, and it was spectacular. It was delicious, yeah? Lots of fun. So that, that actually a plug for teaching your kids to cook before they come to William. <laughs> I was having a conversation with my son yesterday um, about who is interested in possibly in political economy and, or, or economics and other things. But between those two, a question kind of came up, which is like, is there, a, is one more um, susceptible to being called a discipline or not? And I actually started to think, God, I, I'm not sure that I know exactly what a discipline is and wondered if that is a category that the college thinks about or is there just one discipline? So, yeah, so the question is about political economy and economics and, uh, and about what's, what is a discipline? Um, <clears throat> because it, when we say something's interdisciplinary, we're kind of assuming that there are disciplines that you can be inter, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so it, with those two cases, it, um, clearly economics is a discipline uh, and it is something that has, in the, the, you can see it because the major is very structured. Introduction to micro, introduction to macro, in that order, and then intermediate, some, some kind of uh, class in between, and then intermediate macro, or micro and macro, then econometrics, and then on to uh, other things in a senior seminar. So it's much more structured. Uh, political economy is less structured because it's more of, you have a certain number of courses that, you are, that are your um, b basic foundation, which include political science courses, um, but then it has, it's more of kind, of kind of three core courses, and then pick from a few categories type thing. And it is meant to be interdisciplinary and is meant to, uh, in some ways, to contextualize economics. Um, we often say that there are two kinds of political economy. One of them is the politics of economics and the other one is the economics of politics. <laughs> and so this, you know, the, the, that major starts out with the former and often ends up more in the latter. We ask students to do collective projects on public policy. It is, I think, a, a legacy of its founding from 1946 that it is misnamed. It is really a public policy major. And uh, it, you know, it, it is named really kind of for where it begins rather than where it goes. But I do think in general that the college recognizes things called disciplines where there is, there are, there's a need to learn some things before other things and where you, you can't just pick and choose from a menu of courses and that there does make, there, that, that the order of a 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, 400 level course makes sense in some pedagogical sense and in some uh, sense of the depth of learning. Yeah, and to add to that, um, I was thinking uh, about when I've heard the most substantive discussions about disciplinarity in general. And um, uh, it's worth noting that Williams has an unusually robust system of faculty governance. So the faculty of the college oversee the curriculum, which means every single year we vote yay or nay on the package of courses that your students, your kids are gonna take. And this means that we have very active conversations whenever a new concentration, a new major, or a new program arises, and in the time I've been here, some of those conversations have been very contentious, and it's about are we willing as a faculty to admit, for example, that women's gender and sexuality studies is now a new discipline and not merely an add-on to something else. And that happened a good, oh, I'd say maybe 16, 18 years ago when we had that conversation. It was contentious. We voted on it. Some people did not want it. Some people did. But it was 
actively discussed by the faculty and considered by all those who voted on this. So it's something that as the curriculum evolves, as the number of uh, subject areas we teach evolve, we're talking actively about does this constitute a discipline or is it basically something we want to leave in that range of interdisciplinarity? And we're probably running short on time, and thank you very much. Can you comment a little bit on the research and the research that you do with your students during the year versus the summer? Kind of time commitments, how does that work? Each of you kind of touched on that you do obviously a lot of research with your undergrads, but what does that look like? And so I'll just, uh, I'll speak and uh, try to just first preface this by saying this uh, increasingly there are opportunities and creative ways in which students are getting involved in research throughout the college. I mean, I, when I first came here it was, I would say, mostly in the STEM fields where, where this is happening. I think increasingly uh, social science and humanities faculty are engaging students in all ways. And so in the summer we happen to have more than 200 students doing STEM research in, in a very, very active program the college supports in a big way. But there's also large numbers of, increasing numbers of students throughout, in, 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 in other disciplines uh, as well. But spe speaking in terms of what, what the, are the ways that students get involved in research, um, the summer is obviously a fairly intentional nine or 10 week, you get housing on campus, you get paid, it's a summer job, um, and you're working full time. Um, there are a lot of other ways. Uh, for younger students, there's opportunity to be paid as a research assistant just a few hours a week if you can find somebody's research where you can uh, contribute in a, in a small way just to get to know things a little bit. So people do this as a, as a term time job. They, they basically get paid on an hourly basis to work. And sometimes it's hard to work in a lot of time given that you're also doing four other classes and you're just starting at Williams and figuring your way out. So this doesn't tend to happen in the first semester, but, but in the first two years certainly it does. There's winter study, and, I, and we, we, we're in an active discussion at Williams about well, the future of winter study. No one's talking about getting rid of winter study, but we are certainly in an active moment of talking about uh, ways in which winter study could be taken advantage of uh, and could be more effective. Uh, Jim mentioned the travel courses being one wonderful way. Another thing that's a really powerful use of that is that the students will sign up for a course that's basically just to work and work with work and do research for a month. Um, uh, for my, uh, for some of my best experiences with students as first and second years is that they come in knowing nothing about the research. Uh, they work, as I said, senior, and then the, the, just to kind of make it clear, the seniors who are working in someone's lab doing a senior thesis are or, or in any subject are required to be doing that for their winter study in their senior year. They're working full time on their thesis. That's, that's, the, that's the rule. And, and that's often a very productive time for my students. I, I have three thesis students this year, all of whom will be here in January trying to say, okay, let's get busy and do this. So having a first and second year student come in and just do a winter study experiential sort of like get to know research thing can be a really powerful way um, and some of my best experiences with future thesis students have been those who started in this, in this kind of er earlier time. In fact, the two faculty members who are here, who were my former students, both started as sophomores working in, in my lab in, in winter study. So uh, term time research assistantships, we can often help them with summer internships elsewhere if they're thinking about uh, doing research elsewhere, but also summer research and winter study. So there's a lot of different ways and then by choice, doing a senior thesis in the STEM fields would be for those who are really interested in diving deeply into a subject. Um, <clears throat> it, it's not every student does this, it's not required at Williams. Uh, we have a very unusual department where, for example, this year we have 22 physics and astrophysics majors and 17 are doing theses. So we have a very unusual situation in which we have students who are really all in on getting involved in research uh, in this particular way, but, but certainly it happens throughout the college in different ways. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little crazy. <laughs> you know, one of the things that people haven't asked us about, but is sort of in the category of things that have changed, uh, and you might imagine this, is, um, but uh, large language, model, language models in AI are now part of our world. Chat GPT is something we talk about all the time. And so I'm not sure how much it affects uh, Division Three, that is the, the natural sciences, but certainly in my field, and I imagine in the humanities, this is something that has changed the way we do things. We, we um, are now thinking much more about 
uh, performance kinds of uh, evaluation. That is, have the, have the students do a presentation, have the students do uh, a, a video over a PowerPoint presentation, have the students do a podcast or something. Uh, we're bringing the, the standard paper assignment that says, uh, tell us some themes uh, from Paradise Lost. Uh, it's, it's something that ChatGPT will do really, really well. And so we have to come up with prompts that are specific to particular works and, you know, ask for, you know, ask for citations and, um, and, and design things so that they're not so easily um, confected by, by a computer program. Um, and, of course, this is a moving target. Um, you know, if you pay premium, you can get ChatGPT4. Uh, they're working on ChatGPT5, which uh, includes images. And so... Uh, you know, some of us are really going to have to change things, and that does have an impact because we, uh, in a 12-week semester, if you have 24 or 25 classes and you decide to take something from outside the classroom, like a paper, and bring it into the classroom, uh, you've just lost 75 minutes that you were using for something else. So, yeah, we've, you know, that's something that's a challenge, and I imagine you guys both have seen this. I think... I think all of us are dealing with this in different ways. It's, uh, it's, it's certainly early days, and it, it is a little scary to think where it's all going. Uh, so far, I gave ChatGPT my quantum mechanics midterm um, uh, just a, a couple weeks ago, just out of curiosity, and it didn't do very well. So I think I was, I was, I was reassured that, as, as so far anyway, that, well, like... <laughs> I've also, in the uh, tutorial on the Brothers Karamazov, I get around this problem. I don't give them essay prompts. They have to come up with their own topics. And I'm guessing chat P GPT would do a really bad job of coming up with an interesting topic on the Brothers Karamazov, so. Do you have any advice for a freshman who really is just really uh, doesn't know how to start looking for a major. Advice for freshmen looking for a major. So, yeah, sounds like you've had a discussion. <laughs> well, our first advice is, if you're in your first year, you don't have to declare a major right away. You, you, you don't do this until the, scene, until the second semester of your sophomore year. And this is the time to be taking uh, relatively broad courses, core courses, uh, at the introductory level, there is, it does make sense uh, to get a sense of big portions of each field so that you know, yeah, I like this, I'm good at it, or I don't like this. And so, you know, one of the things I would say not to do is to just jump into um, a 200 or 300 level course because the, the, the titles of the course sounds attractive. Um, it'll be, it could be very interesting and they could really like it, but it might be a smaller slice of the field that they're trying to decide upon. Um, so that really, if you want to have a broad sample of what goes on in that field, um, the introductory courses are really a better a way of opening that door. To that, I would add two things. One of them is beware of what I call high school autopilot. All the students who come to Williams are highly motivated and they have excelled in everything they took in high school. And they are accustomed to having a high school schedule that has math, you know, some science, some English, some history, something like this. And so they think they should continue doing that. They don't have to. And it may be that that is what, you know, the particular person you're working with wants to do, but it's, you've got to start trying things that you never had the opportunity to take. That could be sociology, that might be astrophysics, Russian. that might be Russian. Yeah, tell them to come to me. I've got space in my class, clearly. So, um, so try the things that you didn't even know that you could study. So that's the first one. The second one is be an active user of what Williams students call shopping around. Um, so students have a good solid um, uh, week and a few days to decide their final schedule of courses in every semester. And in that period before that deadline happens, they can go to a variety of courses and just check it out. And so let's say you think you're gonna take you know, macroeconomics, but you're really curious about this dance course to show up for a day of the dance course. You'll see who teaches it, you'll see what it's about, you'll see what they do, and you'll figure out, oh, 
either I do want to take this maybe even this semester or in the future, or no, that's not what I thought it was and that's not what I want. So there's nothing like using your own eyes and ears to find out what something's about. So shop around, take yourself to more classes than you're actually going to sign up for. I think next year we need to schedule a session for at least an hour and a half because this has been a remarkable discussion and really excellent questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause to our phenomenal faculty. Thank you for being here.